Hey everybody, Miss High Gamer here, and today we are playing Welcome to Mori Town by A.S. Andrew Swan. Now before I go into that, I want to apologize for not uploading for a couple of months. I think that's how long it's been. That's awful, but we have been moving, and if you don't know by what I mean as... If you don't know by me saying we, then go check out the Crazy Box channel. There's a vlog there, which I will also probably be uploading vlog today, or... I won't say today, because I always do that and then I mess up. Not today, maybe today, you'll see it. It'll probably come out before this video, so now I'm just rambling for nothing. But here, I found this on Steam, and it seemed very interesting. This is a demo, by the way. I don't know how long the demo is going to be, but it seemed very interesting. You have a whole section where you can see your stats, your character, reputation, and your score. So, um... Let's get right into it, and if you play this game, and you see that I have a black background compared to yours, you can go into the menu and you can change how the background color is. I just prefer mine to be dark. So let's get right into it. Let's read, oh yeah, and it's probably going to be a lot of lengthy reading. Alright, and also don't flip out, there's no sound, but I will probably add something in the background, so don't worry. Alright, let's jump right into it. Um. Welcome to Mori Town by S. Andrew Swan. Prologue. <laughs> Prologue. Alright. Welcome to the tail end of the 21st century. It's been a few decades since the end of the last global war, known officially as the Pan-Asian War, here in the United States. This was a war that saw an arms race in genetic engineering. Dozens of countries tried to engineer the perfect soldier but because of UN treaties banning this engineering of the human genome, they were engineering human soldiers. At the time, the United States reacted by banning the practice of genetically engineering sapiens and even went, even went so far as to add a new amendment to the Constitution, giving the sapient products of that kind of engineering to the protection of the Bill of Rights. Given the atrocities happening in labs and battlefields overseas, the measures had barely any opposition, at least not until the refugees started coming. But now it's about 20 million more moros later. Oh, and I apologize ahead of time if I mispronounce words. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> That's what the humans call call you moro, maybe mori, if they're feeling particularly un-PC. And where there are moris, there are mori. There's mori town. The slums and ghettos you and yours call home. Today, the integration of Moris into human society has been rough. Often, it seems that both sides resist the idea as much as they possibly can, to the point it sometimes feels that you live on a different planet from the pinks, which is what Moris call humans, if you're feeling particularly on PC. I actually like that. I like the contrast of their feeling particularly on PC to your feeling particularly on PC. Alright. Chapter 1, The Essex Arms. Oh, sorry. Ooh, I like this. The Essex Arms. You live in the Essex Arms, which you've always thought was a pretentious name for a crumbling apartment building in the middle of Morrytown. At one point, 50 years ago, this place had been luxury condos, but after the Moris started settling around the neighborhood, the old human residents sold to some anonymous development company that subs ugh, subdivided all the condos into low-income housing. The company name on your release has changed every year you've lived here. Right now, it's something something property management. Whoever they are, they, are, they de debit your account on the first and you get a roof over your head for another month. This apartment has been your home longer than anywhere else you've ever lived. It's an odd-shaped studio that was sectioned off when they converted the place. It might be kind of shabby, what apartment in this neighborhood isn't, but you could afford it without any roommates, and despite the shabbiness, you're attached to this place. In particular, alright now here it comes where we can make our own choices, and again we can check our stats as we make our choices. Alright, in particular, I'm a large Mori, and it was the one place where the ceilings could accommodate my size. It had a shower des designed for Moris. I'm a smaller Mori, and I had a deal because anyone bigger would fit in this place. It was one place where I didn't have to deal with human management. Ooh, I kind of like the last two answers. Or, 
options. And again, I'm sorry, I know I'm probably saying this wrong, but um, I'm gonna say it Mori anyway, just in case. Ugh, that's so bad. Anyway, I'm a smaller Mori. Well, mm, I got a deal because anyone bigger wouldn't fit in this place, so taller, smaller, shorter. I'm pretty short, I'm only five foot. Um, it was one place where I didn't have to deal with human management. Let, let's pick that one. Maybe we have, our character has some issues with with uh, humans, <clears throat> known as pinks, I guess. You were under no illusions. You knew the Essex Arms had pink owners, but the fact that the on-site management was handled by fellow Maury's had let you feel much better about the building. Not that any of that really matters to you at the moment. It's five o'clock Tuesday morning, and even though you're standing in your apartment, you are not really there. You received some bad news yesterday, and you can't avoid thinking about it. When you came home on Monday, I received an eviction notice, I received a sub subpoena to appear in court to answer charges, I received a subpoena to appear in court to testify, I received a letter from the IRS. Uh, not a fiction notice, well maybe, let's see. I received a subpoena to answer, to appear in court to answer charges. See this is what I like about these kinds of games, or stories in general, which is uh, either one or both, but this game in general is... It really let you build you as a character in uh, in general, I was going to say, but you're building a character which is you. So let's see. Oh, our stats have already changed, haven't they? I'm 50-50 for these, but this one, I'm more prone to feral. Maybe that's... Okay. Nice. Alright, so maybe we can keep a check on that. Alright, when you came on Monday, I received an eviction notice. I received a subpoena to appear in court to, court to answer charges. I received a subpoena to appear in court to testify. Hmm. Hmm, that's... I don't, I don't think IRS would be a good choice, well, personally, for me. Um, let's see. Subpoena to appear in court to testify, or... I'm tempted be be bleh, between these three. Let's see. It would be interesting to have an eviction notice since you're comfortable in this place you've been in the longest, but I think we'll appear in court to testify. Against a local drug dealer, against a bar fight, in a case of vehicular homicide. Let's say a bar fight. We can always go back and try the other ones. It wasn't your fault that two gangs of Maury's decided to physically arbitrate some disagreement and trash a bar around you. You managed to defend yourself long enough to get out unhurt, but someone somewhere pointed the cops at you as a witness. You made a statement, hoping that would be the end of it. Apparently not. Considering how many folks got arrested that night, this subpoena is probably the first of many. You spent the afternoon fuming about the news until you finally decided to try to make your take your mind off of it. However, despite the best of intentions, it didn't go well. The subpoena still dominated your thoughts even as you tried to hook up with, talk to, talk to an old ex. I don't really have sexual relationships, I just try to find a friend to talk to. Let's see, um, yeah, let's go with this one. Maybe the universe just has it in for you, but no one you knew was lurking around your usual hangouts. You went for a drink at Johnny's, a local bar around the corner. But even the bartender, a weasel with a lisp and a cloudy right eye, only paid your problems a minimal attention. After a while, you even sounded pathetic to yourself and headed home. Your inability to unload your problems on anyone else left you feeling isolated last night. Left you feeling isolated last night, I'm sorry. You feel even more so right now, awake before dawn, naked and alone in your apartment. Why are you naked anyway? <laughs> really, who's who wears human clothing in their own home? I just got out of the shower. I was working out to try to forget about this peanut. Um, let's see. That one. That one works. <laughs> You've always found the process of washing and grooming your fur calming. When you couldn't stop thinking about this peanut, it seemed a good option to take your mind off of things. But since your cheap apartment doesn't have a built-in dryer, you've, you're left to air dry your fur, which isn't nearly as distracting. And when you catch your reflection in the window, what do you see? A female. Alright. Alright, let's see. Oh, feline, canine. Let's go. Ooh, I'm stuck between these two. Um, hmm, I think I'm more prone to, like, werewolf type things. Let's go canine. Canines, as a class, represent a fairly common type of Mori. 
Many countries developed canine mores because they were because they adapted well to military use. And some of the first of viable Ugh, can't stop tripping over my words. And some of the first viable mores were canines developed in North Korea. Canines tend toward what humans consider average size. Though given how common rats and rabbits are, an average mori dog is generally generally bigger than the average mori. Canines generally don't stand out too much in the crowd and can handle themselves in a fight. Specifically, you're just a regular dog, a fox, a wolf. A wolf. Canines may be common in general, but you are not common. Unlike many canines, your ancestors were wolves. You're bigger and more dangerous than the average canine. You stick out more in a crowd. So you're just a lonely wolf pacing naked in front of her apartment's sole window, swishing her tail in agitation. Subpoena rattles around in your brain despite your best efforts to take your mind off of things. It's just too easy to dwell on it now, when it's too late to sleep and too early to go poor and too early to go to your poor excuse for a job. Silently you wish you you wish for something to take your mind off of everything. As you pace past the window, the universe Perverse as it is, decides to grant your wish. I rely on scent and I smell something wrong. I tend to focus on hearing and there's an odd sound. I have a pretty sharp eyesight and I see something in my apartment. I have decent night vision and I see something in the darkness outside. Ooh, all of these are actually really good, um, really good options. Let's see, I rely on scent and I smell something wrong. Or I have pretty sharp eyesight and I see something in my apartment. Um, let's go with this one. You blink a few times and you notice a faint halo around the overhead lights. You stare at it until your eyes stink. Stink. Sting. Smoke. Very faint, but it's definitely smoke. Something's burning. No. You don't want to believe that the building is on fire. You rush to your window and the smoke has gotten bad enough that your eyes sting. You can barely see the lights outside your window. You don't have the best night vision. But the haze outside has made the dark of early dawn nearly impenetrable. You weren't suddenly paying attention. If you weren't suddenly paying attention, you could have missed this first muffed bloom. Boom. What is wrong with me? The vibration feels almost too distant to be real, as if it's happening somewhere else. You want to think it's a car crash, maybe a runaway delivery van. The navigation controls on those automated vehicles seem to fail with a lot more frequency in your neighborhood. But you know that's not what it is, even before the real explosion. Ooh, can we go to chapter two? Out of the fire. Oh, we can. Yay. All right. A horrendous explosion rocks the building, felt more than heard. For a moment, it seems as if your whole apartment tilts one way, then the other, throwing you face first into the ancient shag carpeting. The smoke burns your eyes, making them water and blurring your vision. The air is getting harder to breathe. You struggle to your feet, the subpoena now completely forgotten. You stand naked, hand over your mouth, filtering the smoke. You don't have much time to escape. Are you going to grab anything before you get out? Are you kidding? The place is on fire. I need to get out now. I grab my clothes. I can't go running outside naked. I grab my phone. I need to call for help. I grab my wallet. It has all my cash in it. Ooh. Well, for one, this would be the most viable option, but I don't know how the laws are in... They're in their part of the neighborhood, so let's see. Can't go running outside naked, or should they get their cash? Uh, that's our cash. Let's get cash. You grab your wallet off the small table by the head of your bed. There are only two ways out of the apartment. The front door to the hallway outside and the window. Both appear equally dangerous, since you don't have any clear idea how bad the fire is in either direction. The window is the quicker exit, if you can force it open. But there's no fire escape off your apartment. If there have, if there ever had, that's my dog. I'm so sorry. If there had, if there ever, oh my gosh, if there ever had been one, some street level entrepreneur had sold it for scrap long before you moved in. So that way is an unsafe climb, climb down the side of the building. The corridor isn't precarious, but it's more likely to have the way blocked by smoke or fire. Not ice and fire? <laughs> I'm playing. And more than likely to have other tenants crowding the way out. Alright, so force the window. I don't want to be caught in, in the escaping crowd. Run out the door, escape the way it is. Escape that, uh, 
That way it's faster than a climb. Force the window. The climb doesn't scare me. Run out the door. Someone needs to pull a fire alarm because it's not going off yet. Ooh, yeah, let's do that one. You dash out the door to your apartment. The corridor beyond is hazy with smoke. But the way to the stairs seems clear. You break into a run for safety, ducking as slow as you can manage to avoid the worst of it. A few meters away from your apartment is a small red box in the wall. You reach up and pull the white lever just under the word fire. A klaxon shrieks in your ears and a strobe light flashes somewhere above you, beyond the smoke. Before you, uh, res before you resume your escape, you hear someone groaning in response to the alarm. It sounds as if it's coming from behind the apartment door closest to the stairs. I ignore it. I'm not here to do the fire department's job. I pound on the door, calling to see if someone's in trouble. Alright, yeah. You stop and pound violently on the door, yelling, Are you alright in there? You'll ha you have to repeat yourself several times. After several nerve-wracking sounds, the door creaks open uh, on an elderly feline with a shaggy coat of gray shot tawny fur. It's too hazy in the corridor to make out his exact species, but he's obviously one that doesn't age well. His joints are nami and arthritic, and his pupils are completely dilated and silvery with cataracts. The disoriented cat wheezes, who is it, as you, at you before breaking into a coughing fit. I grab the cat by the arm and run for the steps. I tell the cat he needs to get out of here. The building's on fire. I call for someone to take the sky off my hands. I wasted enough time with the senile old fart time deal. Well, we're going to go with the second option. You try to talk to him, but he keeps mumbling about broken garbage disposable, disposal and how he thinks the toast is burning. He doesn't even seem to register what you're saying. I grab the cat and by the arm and run for the steps. The old Maury seems to be confused more confused than frightened. You guide him easily towards the steps while he keeps muttering things like that man is a quack, they wouldn't let work on humans, and it's not Friday, and did they send you here from the, for the disposal? You tune him out as you both merge with a line of other tenants, of other tenants escaping the building down the stairs and out the emergency exit. You lead him out onto the street where firefighters are already ushering people a safe distance from the building. Now that the old guy is safe, you let him go as the crowd surges with more folks fleeing from the burning apartment building. You lose track of him as a sea of fur separates you. You merge into the crowd of gawkers across from the Essex Arms. It's a scene of complete chaos outside as you're, you're shoved deeper into a crowd of mores massing across the street. Half seem to be tenants of the Essex Arms. You can tell because of the sense of fear and confusion that follows them around. Like you, the majority of the tenants hadn't managed to dress before escaping, but while most people wear something to appease the humans, nudity, nudity is uh, no rarity among fur-bearing people. Sorry, my throat got very, very dry, especially in Morrytown. The rest of the crowd are the gawkers that seem to be spontaneously, that seem to spontaneously appear on the street whenever something starts burning. You push through the thinnest part of the crowd to see what's happening with your building. Half of it is engulfed in fire. You were lucky. The fire is concentrated on the structure opposite the side where you had made your exit. Cherry red flames roll from windows in the lower stories, vomiting clouds of black smoke that half the time hide the rest of the building from view. You only catch glimpses of upper stories, but the few times your apartment window is visible, it appears to be untouched so far. Several fire trucks are here now, and dozens of human firefighters swarm the street between the crowd and the fire. They're pouring water into the building while tiny black drones orbit above them, shining spotlights on hot spots and victims still trapped in the building. Three drones hover in front of a third-story window above some of the worst flames, aiming a blinding trio of spotlights at an opening that seems miraculously free of flames for the moment. A truck levers a ladder toward that window as the inferno below it receives the heaviest attack from the fire hoses. You catch sight of a small white furred figure in an upper window, frantically waving at the humans running the ladder truck. A firefighter mounts the ladder and starts climbing up, even as it still swings into place. Suddenly, the lower floors belch a rolling pall of black smoke between your side of that street and the building. Despite the spotlights, for several tense moments, the top of the ladder and the firefighter are invisible. Then a cheer comes from the crowd as the firefighter backs down the ladder, half leading and half carrying a small white fur in Mori. You feel a surge of emotion. 
I really want to punch something right now. I'm really need to save that person. I'm hoping that the fire misses my apartment. I want to run up for cover. I'm relieved that they saved that person. Yeah. You didn't realize you'd been holding your breath until you saw the firefighter descend with that Mori. Then you gasped with relief, clapping and cheering with the rest of the crowd. Fortunately, it seems that they had that. Fortunately, it seems that that may have been the last person trapped in the building. As you continue watching the fire, you notice something you didn't expect. There's a human in the crowd over there, and whoever it is, they aren't a firefighter. She's standing in the midst of a clutter, of a cluster of moris, mostly rats and rabbits. She stands out because she's tall for a human, female, but female, just a bit under two meters. Her pale skin and golden hair stand out against the mass of fur. She doesn't show the kind of tension that humans typically show around moris. The woman is also overdressed for mori town though any human would probably be overdressed by definition, in a dusky pantsuit. She was talking with members of the crowd, but as the firefighter brings Mori down off the ladder truck, she breaks off and heads towards the rescued Mori. Suddenly, a large shadow crosses your field of vision. Instinctively, you jerk your head in that direction to face the largest Mori you've ever seen. He's big, even for an earth sign. A tower of black furred muscle easily, ma bleh, easily massing two or three times your weight and half again your height. He's dressed in torn jeans that could house a family of four, a leather vest that has some sort of gang logo on the back. Oh, uh, See? I get messed up when I try to read. And a leather vest that has some sort of gang logo on the back. He's standing right next to you, but is paying, no attention, paying you no attention whatsoever. His attention is taken by the fire and the tiny looking phone in his massive paw. That isn't a bad thing. From the look of the guy, the wrong sort of attention from him could be painful. You look away from the bear, trying to act, trying to catch sight of the human female again, and you're jostled by a surge in the crowd behind you. You turn to see a mass of mores moving to converge on a beat up panel truck, the kind of automated vehicle that tends to move through the city anonymously until someone overtaxes its nav computer by doing an unexpected merge. This one is less ominous than usual. The sides of the truck are covered in a swirling mural of figures, Mori or human you can't tell, holding hands around a crude globe. Above the mural, the, wor the words East Side Unity Center are written in large block letters. The truck finishes backing toward the crowd and, at the, and the door at the back rolls up, revealing a lean, muscular feline with spotted yellow fur. He's wearing cut-off jeans, human make. You can tell because of the ragged hole torn in them to accommodate his tail, and a t-shirt with a design matching the pattern on the side of the truck. Jaguar or cheetah, it's hard for you to tell the difference at a distance. The feline talks to the crowd and starts passing out bottled water out the back of the truck. I shove my way through the crowd to see what the human in the pants suit is doing here. I step out toward the human shout, what the hell are you doing here? I join the crowd and saw masked by the rear of the truck, maybe I can help. I push through the crowd by the rear of the truck, need some water as much as anyone. I ask the massive earth sign, what's up big guy? I keep a low profile and try to eavesdrop on the earth sign's phone conversation. Ooh, I'm stuck between these. Um, let's try to keep a low profile, I'm curious. <laughs> Alright. It isn't hard to listen in, at least to the earth sign's half of the conversation. His voice is as big as the rest of them. You, play, you pay closer attention to the bear next to you. He seems to be ignoring you, turning slightly away. While that doesn't make his deep bass voice any harder to listen to, it does give you an unobstructed view of the, black, of the back of his leather vest. The game colors are red and yellow and feature a graphic image of a wolf, genetically unmodified unless you counted apparent giganticism, clutching a, a bloody human in its shawls as it climbs a mountain of skulls human and non-human, backlit by a blood-red sunrise, or maybe sunset. Above the image are the words running dogs and fox uh, acrylic, complete with backwards R's and N's. Well, now you know which street gang this guy belongs to. I haven't seen many saints yet, the bear says in an admirable attempt at a whisper. You can't hear the other end of the conversation, but the bear nods as if he was having a video chat. Right, right, I know. That gets your attention. You might not be a member of any gangs, but you know folks who are. There are a few tenants in your building who are 
who you know are affiliated with a local gang named the Damned Saints. Could they have been responsible for the fire? I could I tell this guy about the gangbangers in my building if the damn saints are responsible for torching my apartment. I wouldn't shed a tear if Big, Brown, and Ugly here decided to grind them into the pavement. I keep eavesdropping. For all I know, the running dogs tried to torch some rivals and it got out of hand. I need to know who's responsible before I grind anyone into the pavement. I keep eavesdropping. Once I know what's going on, I can go to the police. Let's do this one. You turn back toward the fire, trying to fade into the crown or crowd around you. At the same time, you subtly sidestep even closer to the bear so you can try to hear both sides of the conversation. The massive earth sign distractedly says, I don't know who was in the building. Hey, wait a minute. He lowers the phone and turns to face you. Apparently, you weren't as subtle as you intended to be. In his paw, you hear the phone, phone's tiny speaker echo with a distorted female voice with a slight Eastern European accent. Tiny? What's wrong? You hear that and think, of course he's named Tiny. The massive of earth sign looms over you and growls slowly. I think you should mind your own business, don't you? He glares at you a moment before he can get a chance to respond. He turn. He glares at you a moment, and before you get a chance to respond, he turns his back on you, starting and starts shoving his way back through the crowd. Phone back to his ears. He says, "Too many ears here. I'll call back when I know something." Oh well, that could have gone worse. Well, it could have. The human female in the pantsuit is still talking to the rat, th to the rat, the firefighter safe in the building, by the panel truck. The female, by the panel truck, the feline Mori is still passing out water. All right, the same stuff. All right, let me go. Let's not shout at the human. Um, maybe I can help. All right. The feline Mori is moving boxes out the back of the truck all by himself, and you're a little surprised that he hasn't mom been mobbed already. You edge up to the rear of the truck and manage to catch one of the boxes that he's about to set it down. His eyes widen and you tell him, let me go get the next one. He looks at you for a moment, then says, thank you. In a voice that has central, in a voice that has a central African flavor mixed in with the normal feline accent. He goes back to get another box of water as you pull bottles out and start tossing them to the waiting crowd. A few of the refugees from the apartment recognize you and smile weakly as they take their water. After a few minutes, the truck seems to be empty. The cheetah, he's close enough for you to tell his species, tell the species now, looks back into the cargo space and bears his teeth in frustration. You lean up against the truck and say, I think you got everyone water. He turns as if he didn't realize you were still there. He looks over the crowd, which has stopped pressing against the rear of the truck for the moment. He blinks, sighs, and leaps gracefully off the back. Not everyone, he says. Hmm? He gestures over to the firefighters and says in a husky accent, in his, husky, in his husky accent, I don't have any left for them. You're surprised that he'd be upset at not passing water to the humans. I, th I think the city has them taken care of, you say. A little incredisciouth. 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 I cannot pronounce that word. Incredisciouthly. Incredisciouth. Alright, we're just going to go roll with it. I sympathize with his impulse. I don't really understand why he's concerned with humans, to be honest. I don't care one way or another. Ooh. I'm so sorry. Let's do this one. Oh, let's check our stats. We haven't checked them in a while. Oh, okay. Citizen 40, Anarchist 60, Altruism 55, Individualism 45, Conspicuousness 54%, Unobtrusiveness 46%. Attack skill, ability, ability to deal damage, 7%, speed, 60, no, 55%, size and strength, 57%. Uh, my reputation everywhere is 50% except on the streets, 55%. And I don't have lethality or anything. I have female wolf, money, 100, and you are in her. So if I hadn't taken my wallet, then I wouldn't have no money. Interesting. Really? Why would you care about the humans when the city already spends all their resources on them? He should be more concerned with the local Moris. I suppose so, he says. He looks at you. Working in the shadow truck had working in the shadow truck had dilated his slit pupils, giving him a somewhat startled appearance. Have I seen you at the center? You assume he means the East Side Unity Center, as advertised on the side of the truck. You shake your head. Nope. You've heard of the place, of course. It is some sort of combination homeless shelter, community center, vocational, whatever. All in all, not the kind of place you like to hang out at. 
Well, if you are, you're a resident there, he tilts his head at the apartment fire. We can give you a place to stay. We're taking over the gym, so we'll have room for everyone. You nod, even though a bedroll on the floor of a basketball court crammed with a hundred fellow tenants does not sound that attractive. Does not that's, ugh, does not sound that attractive. Thanks for the offer. I'm David Ture, outreach manager, among other things. He holds out his hand. You automatically reach out yourself, but instead of clasping hands, you find yourself suddenly holding a stack of paper. Huh? Would you mind passing those out? I want to make sure everyone who needs help knows where to find it. You glance down at the stack of paper in your hand, then back to, at David, who seems to realize that you were expecting to shake hands. Sorry, he says. Sometimes I let... Sometimes I let my causes get ahead of me. Please, do you mind? It would really help out. All my volunteers are stuck getting the shelter ready. So, let's see. I mind, but it wouldn't be polite to say, no, to say so. He's doing a good thing here. Of course I want to help. When did this guy become the boss of me? I give his crap back to him. Well, let's go with the second. Alright, anything I can do to help, you say sincerely. Thank you, he says warmly. He has a nice smile, avoiding any untoward show of teeth. No problem, you tell him as you turn to start handing out flyers. You move through the crowd, handing out the stack of paper, one sheet at a time. Many of the mores you pass are still in shock from the fire, and you take the sheets without looking and take the sheets without looking at you or the paper. As you pass them, you glance at the flyers yourself. One side of the flyer has the globe logo and the world's east side Un unity center displayed prominently. You see the address, a small map, and a list of services including a food bank, emergency shelter, a rec center, and a bunch of other stuff. That building must really must be really crowded, you think. You flip over the sheet and you see a poster advertising a rally for peace this coming Friday. Apparently there will be speakers, music, and food, all open to everyone regardless of species. If that wasn't clear enough, the bottom of the poster has a stock photo showing an unnaturally happy group of mixed humans and non-humans engaged in some ambiguous game on a green lawn under a cloudless blue sky. You doubt that it, you doubt if that particular image ever existed outside a computer. After a few minutes, you've emptied your stack of flyers. You glance back, but David and his truck are already gone. You suppose he has things to do at the center, especially if the group of Maoris from your building are going to converge there. You look up at your building. Daylight has begun to break. The fire seems to have been extinguished. The firefighters are busy pouring water into the steaming wreck. You wonder if your apartment survived, but you can't see your window from there, from where you're standing. You start edging toward the side of the building where your apartment is, and there's a sudden commotion. Oh, uh, should we do the rest? Uh, I don't know how much left is in the demo. Alright, um, hmm. I'm trying to decide, because I don't know how long the demo is, and I don't want to do the entire demo in a video, in one video at least. Uh, actually, alright. We'll stop it here, and we'll continue with chapter 3 in the next part of the video. Because again, I don't know if it just keeps going, and the demo is... Uh, all the way to chapter 4 or 5. I don't know if chapter 3 is the last part of the demo. If it is, then I'll feel very silly for ending it here, but again, I don't want to make the video super, super long, and this uh, could be a something to look forward to. So if you liked the video, please give it a, if you liked it, then give it a like. Um, make sure you're subscribed and hit the notifications down below. Um, again, I'm so sorry that I haven't uploaded in a while, and I'm Hope you forgive me for that, but thank you so much for being so patient, and, and thank you for 20 subscribers. I never thought that I would get to that number, and honestly, it's not about the numbers, but it's very, it is a very nice feeling that there's that many of you that are checking in and watching videos and actually enjoying them, so thank you for that. But, um, that'll be it for now, and there will be another video very soon, so thank you for sticking with me. Um, it's, uh... I'm still trying to figure out an outro. I'm so sorry. Uh, everybody has a cool outro, but I, I don't. So I guess, um, peace. <laughs> no. So I guess, um, for me, it'll just be, I'll see you in the next video. Bye. <laughs>
Maybe I should do this for the game, I believe. 